yummy hand. I pray. Miwichi how. I help. I listen. The definition of Métis in Canada is a multi-ancestral indigenous group whose homeland is in Canada and parts of the United States between the Great Lakes region and the Rocky Mountains. Métis is a French term for mixed blood, a mix of indigenous and Canadian French. This ethnogenesis took place over time. The hunting and survival skills of the Plains people, such as the Cree, will be passed down to the Métis descendants. So, where does our story begin? The continent of North America has been inhabited by early indigenous for close to 17,000 years, developing into several different ancient civilizations. That land is now submerged underwater, but it was once a great landmass where early hunter-gatherers roamed. As the ice receded, humans journeyed across the ancient land bridge, connecting Asia to North America. In over several thousand years, migrated to the Great Plains, where the buffalo roamed. The Plains indigenous are descendants from these hunter-gatherers and have a rich and beautiful culture that is in harmony with land, water, and animals. Because the buffalo were so plentiful, they were hunted most often. Nomadic bands followed the migration of the buffalo so that they would always have food. Bows, arrows, and spears were used to hunt. These tools were crafted from branches, stone, and bone. These materials, along with hide and feathers, were also used to decorate the weapons. Moose and elk were hunted occasionally. Wolves, lynx, coyotes, and rabbits were caught with traps. Catching an eagle and obtaining its feathers was the greatest of rewards. The bark of dried willow branches were scraped off and the branches seared. The branches were tied together, then meat was hung on them to dry. Buffalo meat was pounded into shreds with a stone, then mixed with hot buffalo fat and berries, and then left to cool and harden. Pemmican, as this food was called, would be a critical food for the sustenance of the fur traders in later years. The herds of buffalo sustained the indigenous for centuries. No part of the buffalo was wasted. The extermination of the buffalo in the mid-1800s had a full and tragic impact on the lives of the plains indigenous. In mid-century, beaver population of the Midwest were depleted and there was a vibrant trade in the buffalo robes and tongues, killing 200,000 buffalo per year. The transcontinental railway in the US was used as an iron horse by which massive hunting parties would shoot from windows, leaving countless buffalo corpses to rot. It was a calculated effort to starve and force indigenous into reservations with little compensation beyond promises of supplies of food and clothing. Baskets were made from ponderosa needles or birch bark. These baskets were used to collect medicines from the outdoors. Labrador could be found in marshes Labrador has moss on it and it's spongy. It can be used to treat stomach flu, chills, pneumonia, headache and burns. It is also used to make salves and tea. However, it was not the only tea the indigenous enjoyed. Wild mint was also crushed and used for tea, same with yarrow. Not only that, yarrow was used as a great salve for burns and can be used to treat fevers and infections. Spruce gum was collected on the outside of the trees, and it could be made into a poultice and applied to blisters and boils, or it could be used to treat toothaches. 
had the great ability to draw out infection. Rose hips grow in many places and are also useful in tea. They are high in vitamin C and are a great source to make jam. Tobacco is the main activator of all the plant spirits. Three other plants, sage, cedar, and sweetgrass, follow tobacco, and together they are referred to as the four sacred medicines. The four sacred medicines are used in everyday life and in ceremonies. All of them can be used to smudge with, though sage, cedar, and sweetgrass also have many other uses. Elders say that the spirits like the aroma produced when we burn tobacco and the other sacred medicines. Traditional people say that the tobacco is always first. It is used as an offering for everything and in every ceremony. Manto, so we down a miskiki, kai musaka na maka nuts ka kisi kak. Guista to tu tago ak huma kispen akusiaki. Mutine nina naskimun. He he. Intergenerational knowledge was passed down through stories. Local knowledge was passed on to adapt people to their environment, and stories are relational. They're about how you as a human interact with other humans and animals. Instead of looking at nature as a resource, the living things were seen to have a spirit. Worldview was shaped through stories, which were interracial. In Canada, the first contact was mid-1500s with the Courier de Bois, and this would lead to centuries of change for the Indigenous people. Known by the English as woodrunners and the New York-based Dutch as bush loppers, the Courier de Bois started out as outlaws. The French government and the Catholic Church both denounced their activities for a variety of reasons, mainly to do with taking their profits. But at the end of the day, they provided an essential service and played a major role in opening up Canada's west for Europeans and bringing beaver pelts east for First Peoples. Courier de Bois traveled deep into the interior of the province in order to trade with Aboriginal peoples who couldn't or didn't want to travel to major trading ports on the eastern side of the continent. Not only was it a very long journey for some, but it was also very dangerous. The Iroquois Confederacy controlled most of the access routes through the southern Great Lakes and could charge any fee they wanted for safe passage. The Huron controlled many of the northern approaches to cities like Montreal and Trois-Rivières and could do the exact same. It didn't take long for major companies, the Northwest and the Hudson Bay Company, to realize that they had a problem. Not enough furs were coming into the east ports. They came up with a series of forts, factories and houses that advanced company influences further and further into the interior. These trading posts meant that the First Nations trappers didn't have to travel as far in order to take their furs with an official company representative. They could spend more time trapping and less time traveling, resulting in more furs and higher profits for both the trappers and the company. The companies needed men to transport the traded goods to these posts, as well as bringing the vast quantities of furs back every year. The Courier de Bois had already proven to be capable of long, arduous journeys. As a result, many were hired as voyagers. It was a tough life, and as one Jesuit priest said, they are the sort of person who thought nothing of covering five to six hundred leagues by canoe, paddle in hand, or of living off corn and bear fat for twelve to eighteen months, or of sleeping in bark or birch cabins. After the Royal Charter of 1793, 
The Hudson Bay Company built trading posts on the Rupert's land and made efforts to reach out to the indigenous for the purpose of capitalizing on the fur trade and generating profits. They trapped beaver, which was traded. The European traders exchanged useful and practical items such as pots, pans, kettles, blankets, mirrors, weapons, and manufactured goods that were not otherwise available to the indigenous. The indigenous liked to maximize their profits and traveled around to various trading posts to see which posts would give them the best trade for their pelts. In order to prevent competition between the posts, the Hudson Bay Company created a document called Standard of Trade Document, and it was used by all trading posts. The Métis are people in Canada who can trace their origins from mixing of First Nations people with European settlers. They were the children born to European men and their indigenous wives. When the fur trade moved west in the 1700s and 1800s, many French-Canadian fur traders found native wives and had children. The children born from these unions formed a new nation in Canada called the Western Métis. There were few European women in fur trade and most fur traders married indigenous or mixed-blooded women for practical reasons. An indigenous woman could set up camp, dress furs, make leathers and clothing, cook meals, gather firewood, make moccasins, net snowshoes, and many other things essential to daily life for the fur traders. And when they bore children, they were called Métis children. Indigenous women not only provided companionship for the fur traders, they also aided in their survival. They were able to translate the language, sew new clothing for their husbands, cook food, and help resolve any cultural issues that arose. There were millions of beaver in North America, and because Canada had cold winters, the beaver's fur was excellent quality. The dark brown coat was thick, with long glossy outer fur, and short soft under or inner fur. This inner fur was used to make felt hats. French and British fur traders set up a partnership with First Nations people to trade for the beaver furs. Beaver hats were considered a status symbol and were sometimes passed down from one generation to the next. Wearing a beaver hat expressed wealth and prestige in society. Once a trapper had captured the beaver, he skinned the deceased animal and removed the long hair from the pelt, leaving only the shorter hairs. These shorter hairs were closer to the skin and could produce soft felts that was strong and long-lasting. The beaver pelts were also waterproof and could be made into hats of various shapes. Trading posts were built to show a country's claim to an area of land and as well provide a place for the trade of furs. A trading post served as a general store where furs could be traded. It could have a workshop where some trading items were made such as axes, Fur trading posts also provided living quarters for company employees, and they were also known to be used to protect colonies from enemy raids or attacks. Courier de bois, or voyageurs, traded items such as mirrors, liquors, knives, pots, cooking utensils, beads, linen, wool, cloth, gunpowder, rifles, and lead in exchange for beer pelts. The French men carried the furs from the First Nations villages to the trading posts while traveling long distances through lakes and extreme wilderness conditions during all the seasons. In the 1800s, a currency was developed. It was a series of coins or tokens and represented the estimated value of a beaver pelt. All trading items had their value expressed in relation to the beaver pelt. If the indigenous did not spend the full value of the pelts they brought to the trading post, they received beaver tokens for the difference to be exchanged for goods at a later time. When beavers became scarce, the Hudson Bay Company moved their trading posts inland to find new sources of supply. Where the beaver was not abundant, the company traded goods for whatever animal was locally considered valuable. On the Pacific coast, it was the salmon, and in the far north, it was the Arctic fox. Contact with the European fur traders had long-term impact on the indigenous diseases for which the indigenous had not been exposed to, such as measles, smallpox, bubonic plague, tuberculosis, and influenza, decimated their population. It is recorded millions of indigenous died from European diseases during the first two centuries following contact. In terms of death toll, smallpox killed the greatest numbers, followed by measles, influenza, and bubonic plague. 
indigenous were not used to alcohol and the brandy or whiskey, also known as fire water, that was traded for beaver pelts. Some craved the liquor and developed addiction problems which decimated relationships and connections within indigenous cultures. The role of indigenous women was drastically altered. Indigenous women were leaders and caretakers in their traditional matriarchal communities. They initiated trade relationships with other indigenous communities and ensured their village had enough goods to go around. However, the European traders did not value their leadership and often refused to trade with them, instead insisting to trade with their husbands. Métis played a vital role in the success of the Western fur trade. Not only were they skilled buffalo hunters, but they were raised to both appreciate indigenous and European cultures. Their understanding of both societies helped bridge a cultural gap, resulting in a better fur trade relationship. The Métis followed the fur trade. Their music and their culture were unique, and they realized they were distinct. The Red River Jig is important to the Métis people because it's an expression of their unique heritage. It's a blend of indigenous footwork with Celtic dance steps and French songs. Music was inherited from the European fiddle and provided by the French. Both the Scottish and Irish brought their music from their homelands and jigging was inherited from both cultures. The Red River Jig is the unofficial anthem of the Métis people with the Métis distinct style. The Métis jig is important to have in their own events, such as annual summer events, because it brings up the spirit of the Métis people in their daily lives. The high sounds of the fiddle are represented with a scuff shake shake. It's more of a traditional style that comes from their European cousins, the tap dancers and cloggers. The low sounds are represented with footwork that reflects the low sounds of drums. The low sound in the fiddle also signifies do a change, called fancy steps similar to their cousins First Nations powwow dancers. The Métis sash is symbolic of the Métis identity. Their sashes were made from a supply of wool from the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company. The sash was an important trade item. Settlements and families developed colors and patterns to identify the community that they were from. The five to six foot long Métis sash was used as a distinct cultural symbol and as a tool for life from the 1700s through to the 1800s. The sash could be used as a rope or a harness, a towel or a washcloth, and items such as medicine, pipes, tobacco, or a first aid kit could be tucked into the sash or tied onto it. The fringe knots could keep count of the days or even the hides and furs collected. The fringes could even be taken apart and the threads could be used for sewing. Each color had its own meaning and representation. According to the BC Métis Nation, red stood for the bloodshed over many years of the Métis people fighting for their rights. Blue is for the deep spirit among the Métis. Green was for the fertility of their great nation. Yellow was for prosperity. White stands for the connection between the earth and creator. And black stands for the dark period of suppression and dispossession of the Métis lands. and First Nations of Manitoba were concerned about their survival. In 1869 and 1870, the Red River Resistance took place to protect Indigenous rights. They were worried that the future railway would harm their ways of life and the influx of Canadian settlers may assimilate them. The Canadian government sent troops to ensure that the province stays Canadian. Riel and many others fled. 
Those that stayed thought that perhaps the Métis way of life could continue in the future, and those that wanted to fight realized that they did not have a reasonable chance, for they did not have a strong Métis political leader to back them up. The Métis and First Nations hoped that the Canadian government and Canadian settlers would allow the Métis and First Nations to live with minimal involvement with Canada. As time passed, they realized that this was not going to happen. Their worries came to a boiling point in the early 1880s. Canadian land surveyors wanted to change how the Métis and First Nations laid out their land, and the influx of Canadian settlers made them realize that their way of life was going to change. The Canadian government had been purchasing Indigenous land through treaties. Furthermore, the Buffalo population had virtually disappeared. The Buffalo gave the Indigenous people food, fur, survival, and spiritual connection with the land. The Métis and First Nations tried to appeal the Canadian government, but time and time again, the federal government was not interested. Prime Minister John A. Macdonald prioritized his goal of a Canada from coast to coast, and in order to do so, he needed to have Canadian and European settlers live in the West. The Métis reached out to Louis Riel, who had been exiled to the United States of America. In 1884, Riel agreed to return to Western Canada once again, believing he was a prophet of God who would protect the Métis and First Nation from their uncertain future. Riel had made demands with the Canadian government, but they didn't listen. The Métis and First Nations mobilized their fight. Riel may have been the political leader, but it was his close friend, Gabriel Dubois, who was the military commander and resistance fighter. The resulting violence is what we now call the Northwest Resistance. The first of the fighting was between Métis forces and the Northwest Mounted Police, the police force which would later become the RCMP. Gabriel Dumont and his forces were able to defeat the police with guerrilla warfare, also known as hit-and-run tactics. The Métis and First Nation knew the land much better than the Canadians which allowed them to set up ambushes and gain tactical advantages. Prime Minister John A. Macdonald understood the severity of the fighting and sent the Canadian Army. The Canadian Army was able to travel rapidly to the West due to the new railway. Once the Army showed up, this tested Gabriel Dumont's forces. The Métis and First Nations were still able to win battles, but they also lost some as well. The final battle was the Battle of Batoche. The Battle of Batoche was like most battles that the indigenous forces fought. They picked a favorable position with a high ground and forest to hide and take cover in. From there, they used guerrilla tactics, moving in and out of their positions. When finding a pocket of resistance fighters, the Canadian army set up a fortified camp. They sent in their troops and attacked the indigenous fighters. Then the army retreated back to camp. This was done a few times to strain the resistance fighting capacity. After a few days of fighting, the Métis and First Nations fighters ran out of ammunition. They realized they could not compete with the well-supplied and industrialized army and surrendered. After this battle, the North resistance was effectively over. Many Métis and First Nations were worried about the consequences of the resistance. Gabriel Dumois fled to the States, among with many others. However, Louis Riel surrendered. He was brought back to Ottawa and put on trial for high treason. The all-Canadian jury found him guilty, but pleaded mercy in the death penalty. The judge decided Riel to be hanged for his actions. The Northwest resistance was the last time the Indigenous people were an effective military force in Canada. Long-term consequences that followed were the disenfranchisement of the First Nations and Métis people through land treaties and residential schools. Land of the silver birch, home of the beaver, where still the mighty moose wanders of blue.